slides. Uh, one's just going to be a few touch points on seed bed, soil prep, a couple herbicide reminders, uh, seeding depth, those kind of things. And then we'll touch in a little bit on the hybrids quick. So uh, pre-seed herbicide application. Just a lot of times we're trying to think, hey, what do we need? What are we going to use? These are some common pre-seed herbicide chemicals. Uh, tank mix partners with your glyphosate. Uh, atrazine, which I'm sure lots of you guys are familiar with using. Vermoxinol. Uh, Conquer 2, which has Vermoxinol in it. Heat Complete. Focus. One we use a lot of in my neck of the woods is Valterra. Uh, we deal with kochia nonstop, so so that's our go-to on kochia. We uh, don't have any down here. Okay, that's it's good. Right Keep it that way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Goldwing, uh, Blackhawk, and uh, Furious, and Heatel Cube. So, okay, seed bed and soil prep. That's basically what this whole thing's about today. Is your seed bed soil prep and your mechanical aspect with planting. Uh, I go out to PIs every year, product inquiries, and uh, it usually boils down to something that was done laying the foundation or in the foundation. Can't stress it enough, 90% of uh, establishing a successful corn crop starts right there. You build the house on a crappy foundation, it's gonna crumble. So, uh, one of the biggest contributing factors to yield loss is uneven emergence. So ideally from very first plant to very last plant, we want an emergence window of 48 hours. Uh, poor emergence can cause a 25 to 50% biomass yield reduction in your stand. Look at those ears. What ear would you guys want? Number ones, number twos, or number fours, or number five? Probably the number ones, right? They look pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is what you call a flag test. And Dustin will talk a little bit about it today too. Uh, it's a good, good indicator to see how your emergence does. Let's see effects of uneven emergence on cob development. So basically number one, those flags. Number two, different color flag. Number three, number four, as we see those plants emerge come back and uh, we can see the effects of the uneven emergence in that plant stand. Possible reduction losses, that's real, I took that picture. Uh, I drove all the way to Quinell, BC, <laughs> toured the peace country, I had corn going on up there. Lost my keys in Chetwin, BC, changing into my shorts down by the river. It was getting hot in the truck. Found I had my spare set in the truck, thank goodness. Uh, got to Quinell. I didn't even have to get out of the truck to see what had happened that here. A That's a cornfield. Oh, yeah, cornfield. so this is, a, this, is, this is a picture of everything you can do wrong. Uh, so his ground, uh, heavy residue, poor residue management. He had seeded very shallow, his ground was cold, uh, and then he watered it with glacier water. Back there is the Fraser River. Watered it for six days after with mountain fresh water. It's good for us, but not good for corn. Uh, so when we look at the reduction losses, population six to 12, spacing six to 12, back to that uniform emergence, 25 to 50, and that planting window, 12 to 25. Seed bed and soil prep. We always want to make sure that we uh, manage our trash and residue. Uh, even seed spacing and planting depth is pivotal. Ideal emergence window from very first plant to very last plant emerging in that field is 48 hours. Skips and misses translate to tillers and multiple cobs for a plant. We've all seen that where a cob has more room where there's two plants together and they start tillering off. So we want that singulation and uh, we can expect a reduction in biomass due to poor planting. Okay, so this is, this is neat and this is overlooked sometimes. Uh, all my hybrids that we're growing, I'd tell you if they weren't, but all my hybrids are flex years. That's some nice big ears you guys had this year. That's a flex year hybrid. 
So if you ever look in a seed guide and you'll see recommended planting population 34, 35, 36,000, that's an indicator that it's a determinate ear. Determinate ear hybrid, the only way, way to get your field yield up is to put more plants down. Flex ear hybrids, they uh, can adjust to good or poor growing conditions by increasing its ear size and yield while a fixed ear hybrid cannot. So that's like our leafies that we're growing where we have some more heat. Uh, we can't yet around your guys, we're not in that season yet, right, with our maturities. But uh, our leafy hybrids, uh, with that leaf index on top, we're actually cutting the population back to like 28 to 30,000 plants. Final stand density, big leaves, big solar panels, big tons. Same thing with 913 though, remember that. It's got that big broad leaf on there, we're capturing that sunlight, converting that sunlight to sugars. Those sugars are feeding that ear, feeding it with starch and we're getting that field yield that way. That flex here, it just keeps growing and filling, right? Remember the nice big deep kernels we were seeing? Those are our storage capsules. That's where the tons are coming from. Determinate ear or fixed ear, girth and depth stay relatively the same. Yield increases as seeding rate increases. Semi-fixed or semi-determinate, you get minimal increases in cob girth length and kernel depth. A lot, of, a lot of hybrids, like uh, there's still lots of fixed ear hybrids and, and semi-fixed. I like a flex ear hybrid on feed corn. I've always found they're the ones that throw the tons. So general planting guidelines. We want that warm, firm seed bed and uh, corn is susceptible to cold stress. We have to remember that. Literally can't stress it enough. Uh, we have to watch our weather going into that planting. Warmer moist conditions for the first 24 to 48 hours after planting can mitigate much of that cold stress. So if we're going to plant, let's say we're, we're nice and warm or that 10C at two inches and uh, this is great, we're going in and then we look at the forecast and we've got a cold gnarly rain coming the next day, let's back off. Uh, Rule of thumb is the soil temperature of a consistent 10 degrees Celsius for three consecutive days at two inches of depth. Watch those weather trends. And we have to remember that that corn seed, I should have 25 to 30, but it takes about 25 to 30% of its weight, its kernel weight in water to germinate. That's why it's so susceptible to that cold stress off the start. Germination under cool stressful conditions can cause rupture in the cell membranes, resulting in fused coleoptiles or abnormal mesocotyl development, that's where you'll see that little pigtail coming up, or even seed death. So, uh, I should have updated the slide, sorry. Our seed treatment is treated with Fertenza Maxim Quattro Stamina. We do also do Cruiser Maxim Quattro Stamina. Uh, reasoning behind the Cruiser, we like to have two options. Wire worms are on the Fertenza. Cruiser is a more known wire worm product. We use lots of Cruiser up at, up at home. Uh, Fertenza really shines uh, on the cutworms. They're both very, very, very good. And stamina, the formulation is built on F500. That's your same active in the old headline, is what stamina is. So uh, offers the excellent disease control and improved emergence in cold conditions. And it inhibits fungal respiration which deprives your pathogens of energy for growth and development. Okay, planting depth. We don't ever want to be too shallow. Too shallow is no good, especially with the breezes we get around here. And uh, depending where you're at, shallow can do a couple different things. We go too shallow at home, drought stress, right? We don't have the ability to water. Bad things can happen fast. So ideally, Two inches, two, two and a half, I like to be two, is ideal under normal conditions if we have enough moisture to germinate. And like Dustin was touching with you downstairs earlier, at least be a quarter inch under that moisture. Uh, if we go shallower than an inch and a half, what you're gonna see, there's your mesocotyl, and then your growth point, your, your, your brace roots are gonna fan out on top of the soil. They won't anchor in properly. So you're gonna have you're gonna have troubles with standability, drought stress, water stress, uh, a whole gamut of factors. So we need to use extreme caution when planting shallower. Uh, shallow seed is more susceptible to the weather, uh, especially in lighter soils. 
Shallow rooted corn plants suffer dramatically during periods of drought, less able to uptake water and nutrients through the roots, and it can also develop rootless corn syndrome. Plants will lose structural integrity with the soil to the lack of nodal brace root development, and you gotta strive for that good firm seed bed and good seed to soil contact, which Dustin will touch up on with the planters and uh, kind of that's the start to a path to a good strong root system. Uh, determining stand establishment, uh, we can go out. Uh, I did it with you guys this year when we were looking at yields and stuff like that. Same thing, go in one one thousandths of an acres on row crops are super easy. Uh, so 913, uh, which we're growing with everybody here, uh, 30 inch center, 32,000 seeds per an acre, 17 and a half feet, we should have 32 seeds. So it gives us a good indicator. Uh, it's, it's really good to go out there and string out on those rows, and then you can look at your singulation as well, right? It paints a really neat picture once you start looking down at that, down at that stubble. We can cut them plants off, bundle them up, get a wet hanging weight. I had it with me here this year when we ran them through the chipper and drank beer on the tailgate while we waited for it to cook down on the coster tester. Not a bad deal. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, get it right down to the dry matter and everything, right? So, uh, fertility. So, the ideal soil pH is 6 to 6.8. Uh, always watch out the effects of acidity and alkalinity and its role in nutrient availability of the plant. At home, we have solenensic soil and spots. It's, you guys got to watch it, right? Uh, when we look at the growth curve or the nutrient curve, uh, we need to be available all the way through the growing season, especially during that cob fill. Uh, we're starting to starting to get some pretty heavy nutrient requirements. So this is starting with a blank slate. This is saying there's nothing in the soil. As a rule of thumb, it takes about nine pounds for one ton of silage. I like putting about 30% ESN in my blends. I want to reserve it for that June, July into August. I want to make sure I have available nitrogen for that cob fill. Uh, being underwater helps, right? Uh, yep. You, why can't you just dump some uh, fertigates and 28s? You can fertigate too. Yeah, I made this for this. This presentation was made for non, 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 -fer non fertilizing. Yeah. Yeah, 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 no, fertigation's good, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so if you can get that nitrogen there, that's that's good. Uh, so it's main role early season. When you're fertigating, do you start out with the same amount of fertilizer, like how many pounds? Oh, so what a lot of guys do when they fertigate? No, like when you start with the same dry fertilizer and then go to the fertigate, what's the pound that you start with? Mm, uh, that all be relevant to the ability to put down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What so. Are you guys doing? Yeah, just put down two hundred pounds of nitrogen. Two hundred pounds of nitrogen. Two hundred to three hundred. Yeah. Quite a bit yeah. of yeah. And then thirty pounds. Twice yeah. 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 Then a lot of guys will uh, during that growth curve there. Once we get past May, they'll start doing doing tissues about every other week on it and. And spice up their concoctions. Yeah. Would you put Invita on it? Invita? You, you know what? I did some Invita trials, Ben, and they both got hailed out. This was about three years ago before Invita was even here. So I don't know. I, that's a, yeah. I did some last year, but I didn't get flagged. Mm -hmm. We didn't know where it was. It never showed up on yield maps or drone imagery. So. Like, what were they? I, I actually was in an Invita presentation here a couple months ago listening to it. And uh, I can't remember the bushel increase they're showing. Was it like a seven bushel increase average in the States or something like that? So, yeah. But the, you look at a corn, like we could, I should have brought a cob, but when we start dissecting that plant, 60% of that mass coming from that ear, 40% from the grain, but we're getting another seven bushel out of 180 bushel. Where's it pencil out on our tonnage, right? What it does to the rest of the plant, the stover, I, I don't know. Uh, I'd, I'd have to see and see more off it to, to say uh, yes or no, but uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, the nitrogen, uh, 
remember it's the building block to your plant proteins. Uh, its major role is a component of chlorophyll, which is essential for photosynthesis. We don't have good photosynthesis. We don't have good tons. We want to be able to rock that sunlight and, uh, and make those sugars. Yeah. So adequate N availability in corn allows the plant to reach its uh, true genetic yield potential. Phosphorus, it's about 5.5 pounds per ton of silage. Corn likes its phos early. Reasoning behind that, that little corn seed that you got out there, it relies on stored carbohydrates till about its third leaf. That's when them roots are anchored in. So if we can get FOSS availability or to it available early, it's huge. It uh, helps stimulate root growth and promotes that vigorous seedling growth off the start. So uh, that's that's probably probably one of the biggest game changers there. If you have the ability uh, to put liquid FOSS down, uh, FOSS kit, Alpine, uh, those kind of things, it's it's noticeable. Potassium. Uh, so this is going off what they do in Manitoba or different places in the States. Uh, you guys potash heavy over here, this part? Not like us, Gary, as much? No. Well, we have, like, probably seven, eight hundred thousand pounds somewhere in there. Yeah. yeah, okay. So the biggest thing with potash uh, is availability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it gets overlooked lots. Generally, it's a one-to-one -one ratio of your nitrogen requirements. Uh, potassium is fundamental for the movement of your water, nutrients, and carbohydrates within the plant. So we picture that off the start as well, right? Because we're relying on those stored carbohydrates. Uh, if we can access that potassium, uh, big changes within that plant structure. Uh, that early growth increases that protein production and improves the efficacy of water use and resistance to disease in insects. And then back again, that we're relying on those accumulated carbohydrates as our only energy source to that third leaf. Sulfur, it's about 1.3 pounds per ton of silage, and uh, its main role is protein synthesis and uh, is needed for photosynthesis and chlorophyll formation. Okay, emergence. Emergence variability can be expected if we run into cooler conditions. So as a general rule of thumb, uh, we can expect it to pop, emerge around seven to 10 days after planting in favorable conditions. That's that two inch planting depth, ideal soil temperatures and good soil to seed contact. I've seen it emerge earlier and I've seen it emerge a lot later. Uh, so we gotta look at all the varying factors. But So staging, this is something uh, just to touch up on just in case we don't get the chance to do it before this first spray timing. Uh, once pop or ground crack has occurred, so your emergence stage, that's BE, it begins as soon as the coleoptile emerges from the soil. Uh, the VE stage ends as the leaf color, the first true leaf appears. Uh, so this is kind of neat, this is a little fact here. That coleoptile encloses the four to five leaves that were formed in the embryo of the seed that remain leaves and are sequentially initiated by the growing point between germination and V5. Uh, so when I do my leaf staging, when you're going out and wondering when to spray, uh, the easiest way to do it, I found, is by the collar method. That's where you only count the leaves with visible collars and ignore the leaves still in the whorl. So one thing you got to watch out for, uh, especially not so much off the start, but when we get into that second spray timing, uh, there could be another leaf. If you go out in the morning and you come back out, all of a sudden we have one whorled out, right? That's how fast it grows. So uh, the collar is generally a lighter green or slightly yellow band. Depending on the hybrid, uh, it appears near the stem of the plant. Staging begins with the first true leaf, which is shorter than the rest and has a slightly rounded tip. Always use caution when staging your corn plants. If you stage early in the morning, think of possibly counting leaves with barely noticeable collars. Is there a chance they'll be fully visible by the end of the day? So, and then alternatively, you can stage late in the day and consider not counting the leaves with barely noticeable collars. So your spray timing for your first application with your glyphosate, relatively straightforward. Uh, rule of thumb, uh, up to V8 is starting at V1. So as long as you don't have any ground crack, we all can remember that doesn't count as a spray. If you're not sure of it, count that as, a, as an application. Uh, 
So uh, all of our glyphosate hybrids are R2, so you can spray up to 1.34 liters of 540 glyphosate with a maximum application of 0.67 liters at one time. That being said, you don't have to spray all 0.67 liters. Uh, maybe it's just a little, little bit of volunteer cereals, and you can go in at a 0.32 and reserve, reserve that glyphosate for another application. Uh, so uh, I can't stress it enough, especially during the second application when we have more canopy, uh, but coverage is always key. Uh, please go in with a high H2O rate. Uh, preference straight spray, spray and new to your dogs. <laughs> preference to spray at 10 gallons whenever possible. Results are noticeable. So, and there's other ones too. I should add it to the slide. Sorry guys, it was a rush. Uh, probably using lots of distinct around here too, right? Uh, yeah. So these are these ones are partners that are pretty common uh, with your glypho sortan. Uh, Sortan does nothing on kosher, so we don't really use it anymore at home. It's kind of weak on lamb's quarters too. Yeah, yeah. That, though, it's really good. Uh, focus. Yeah. A lot of focus. Yeah. yeah. Focus and Sortan usually gets you covered pretty well. Covers you good. Nice. Uh, Armazon. Uh, you get a touch on the barnyard grasses and the foxtail. You're green and yellow. It gives you a little longer window too. Gives you to that seventh leaf. There we go. So that's on that one. We have laid the foundation to a successful corn crop, but not quite yet because this was made before we were doing the presentation with Dustin. I'm going to skip to one more slide here, guys, and uh, we'll let Dustin present. The dent's traditionally the maturing. The dent? Yeah, so that's that's good. We'll we'll look at some different kinds of corns on this slide, and then I can show you how different different kernels will express themselves. So, uh, nine thirteen dryland crop up by Camrose right there. So, uh, one thing we pride ourselves on. This is funny. This. That's Ron, that's my Saskatchewan co-worker. He, uh, he was nervous standing behind the cow. I'm, I'm the cow guy with North Star. I come from a feedlot and, and uh, live and breathe it still. But uh, one thing we do pride ourselves on, that's our slogan, cornbread for your herd, not your combine. Uh, I don't know if you noticed your bags that came in, they actually got a cow on them now, Gary. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Non-binary non cow, it's oh, white, it's so no one complains. <laughs> Yeah, the color. It, yeah, color it whatever color we want. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna skip through this fairly fast because we had some touch points from that last slide. Uh, but there's some stuff on here that I want to touch up on quick. Dual purpose hybrids versus feed specific. There's roughly 90 million acres planted in the U.S. every year. Out of that 90 million acres. About 8 million acres is devoted to the forage segment, to silage corn. So when a lot of companies are breeding these plants, they got one thing on their mind, that's pounding it through a combine. They have hybrids that exhibit traits that aren't completely desirable to that grain corn segment as a true hybrid. That's when they get the stamp that calls them a dual purpose hybrid. A dual purpose hybrid is combine silage. A dual purpose hybrid isn't strictly cow food. Feed specific hybrid, that's silage grazing. Uh, they truly are apples to oranges scenario. We're combining corn. We want high grain yield, high test weight, as dry as possible at harvest time, a hard kernel to reduce that possibility of splits, small, hard and dense, stiff and solid as possible with the stock. Stock moisture, you'll hear the term stay green lots of times, different companies. That's a, that's a combine term. Stay green, it's meant to keep that plant as live and as viable as possible to have that ear reach physiological maturity, to reach black layer. I don't want a hard dense ear in a wet plant. I want 65% moisture in my stem and leaves in my stover and 65% moisture in my ear. When we start in siling, it makes a huge difference. That's where we don't have that heating in that pit. 
our anaerobic process is nowhere near as laborious, we don't have to break down that hard vitreous starch to ensile, right? We can get to work right away. We have less heating, less heating, less degradation and ensilement quality, and less dry matter loss. It takes a lot of energy to break down that hard starch in that pit. We'll go through, it's almost dissipated through your silage sample, right? You can feel the, feel the starch on the leaves with our hybrids. Uh, yeah, ear height, and ear height, it is all relevant to growing conditions. I, I, I'll be the first to admit, I had some high ears and spots this year at times. The inner nodes there stretched out. We had just the way the plants grew this year. Uh, but if we would have had a grain corn hybrid behi beside it, they'd probably have a higher ear than what I'd have. So a grain corn hybrid, you want a nice high ear, less material to run through the combine. Feed corn hybrids, you want to keep that ear as low as possible. Reasoning behind that is uh, the higher the ear, the more lignified your stock has to be to support that ear, right? The lower the ear, less lignification on the outside on that rind, then we have better fiber digestibility. So we want to keep that ear proportionately low to the plant. 913, it grows a big tall plant. It's going to have a higher ear than a hybrid that's two feet lower. And that's just the nature of the beast, right? Uh, so anyways, uh, yeah, you want that high ear on that combine corn, that low ear on that feed corn. So I want high total plant yield, the digestible forage. Number one, we want tons, but I want digestible tons, especially for you guys with the dairy, right? We want that good, effective, digestible fiber. That's the nice thing too, when we're cutting these flowery hybrids. It, like that flowery, it doesn't, it doesn't take much to blow them apart. They're meant to blow apart that kernel. Guys are backing those kernel processors off and that's more we can get into with the cutting later on in the season. Uh, but if we can keep that fiber more effective, we get better rumen retention. We're not pulverizing everything as fine, right? So that's the neat thing with the flowery. Uh, I think I've told you all before, we physically can't combine our corn. So when we do our seed corn harvest, we strip the ears, goes to a dryer, it gets brushed off the cob set. That's how we harvest flowery corn. We go into a flowery corn field to harvest it, combine it, we're gonna have a snowstorm coming out the back end of the combine. But what do we want when it goes through your silage cutter, through your cow? We want that starch to, to be a part. We don't want large aggregate, right? Uh, so we want that nice big large kernel. We want it to break easy. Uh, we want that stock to dry at a complementary rate of 65% moisture. And we want to keep that harvest window open. Uh, you guys were able to take it off at pretty good timing, everybody, right, this year? That nice long 21, 28 day harvest window, that's beautiful. Especially if you're waiting on a custom cutter or you know, you're rushed with other things, it's meant to dry down slow. Uh, we don't have to run that risk of over drying. Uh, that low ear again, and uh, the large plant with the soft stalk, moist ear. That's our ideal grain and our ideal silage. So the kernel type spin. This is kind of what you're talking about with the dent on top. So you're gonna have three different types of kernels. You're gonna have a vitreous flint. So you're gonna have that hard, hard starch layer. That's your popcorn. Popcorn's flint corn. Uh, it won't dent in on the top. And then you're gonna have a flintaceous dent or a modern grain. It's gonna have more flowery starch in the middle of that endosperm, uh, but has a hard starch layer on the outside. It's kind of that, that middle bounce between having a product that you can still handle numerous times and then have a viable, good millable product where uh, a vitreous flint, if you split one in half, it's gonna be basically hard yellow starch. And then you have your flowery, which is soft flowery starch throughout the whole kernel. So there's your flint, your dent, and that there, that's a, that's a flowery split in half. Okay, this is a neat one too. I think I've done it with some of you guys, but just when you're out walking through fields and you wanna see that starch expression on your plant, grab your pocket knife, just shave the top of the ear. That'll give you your expression of your richer starch layer. That there, that's a flowery hybrid on the, on the left, and that's a, a dent style hybrid on the right. So the ear types, this is good. 
So this is back to that fixed versus semi-fixed versus flex. Uh, talked about it before on that last slide, but it's always good to remember a fixed year is stated as it is, genetically programmed to de show a determinate cob set. Uh, it'll show an increase in field yield as seeding re uh, rate increases. Girth and depth stay relatively the same. Uh, you will see some movement with a semi-fixed or semi-determinate, depending on environmental and fertility. Uh, and a flex year will give you the opportunity to maximize your yield potential. They can adjust to good or poor growing conditions and increase its ear size and yield when a fixed year hybrid cannot. That's a, that's a fixed year. Those are flex years, semi-flex years, flex years. Okay, that's your vitreous flint. That doesn't look very yummy, does it? Yeah, that's uh, that hard, dense kernel. Notice there's no denting on top. That's actually, it's still around that hybrid. That's Pioneer 39F44. That's it, you used to go around that old Spinoca through there, early season, Rimby corn. Uh, agronomically, it's just like a little plant with an ear on it, but it's, uh, it is early, right? So, uh, it's your perfect yeah, it, it does. I, I'm going to try popping some this year. That's a good, good project here. Yeah. That or, that or your Thanksgiving display on the table with all the gourds and little pumpkins, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. This picture of the large flex here. That's my arm right there. That's that flex year at work. You can see it uh, throwing on that nice girth, nice deep kernels. You're not going to throw more kernel rows on, uh, but you're going you're gonna to have good depth on those kernels. You'll get more cob girth. Uh, this is over, this is north of Concert, Alberta. Uh, Czar, dryland corn, same guy, all planted within a couple days of each other, just to show that flex here at work. Back to that nice tall plant. Uh, what we're shooting for, so a lot of people back in common thinking was the bigger the plant, the less digestible it is. Not necessarily so. Uh, notice that nice big piss center in there. That's where we get the standability of our plants. They're soft, whippy, flexible plants. Large piss center, when we look at the pit to rind ratio, the bark on the outside. Notice the difference here between this one here that's actually a common, very, very, very common feed corn hybrid, probably some grown around here. That's uh, 1017 is what that is. That coarse outer structure on it, less digestible fiber. Those big leaves, uh, it's hard to believe, but this corn here, that's my mother and father-in-law. That's uh, Big River, Saskatchewan, way up north in the bush. So they grow... Uh, couple hundred acres every year, corn grazing, double hot wired in the yard, or right from the yard for bear, <laughs> to keep the bears out of it. Uh, what we're seeing though, like this plant's 13 feet tall, right? Uh, is once we hit that 11 foot mark at times, it doesn't happen all the time, but a spin off from our genetics. So a normal, normal corn plant will have six to seven leaves above that ear. Our leafies generally around here will have 11 to 13. 913 isn't a leafy. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. It has the opportunity to throw that extra leaf expression. More leaf, more solar panel, more tons, more digestible fiber as well. Uh, so when we look at that flowery, that small particle size, that long room and retention, uh, high energy starch, ration type adaptability, and high quality milk. I should touch on that rumen retention talking to Gideon Ben just off the start with feeding. Uh, it feeds different. Uh, went through it at Milford as well, right? Uh, Andy was saying it fed a little, little different. Uh, or not Andy, sorry, Mike. Uh, it shows good on paper, but it does feed different than it shows on paper. And uh, I think Gideon was saying he was around 46, 47 pounds intake a day uh, on the dairy cows, went to 913, up to 59 pounds intake, just boom. He said he's never had cows take it in like that. All of a sudden it was a matter of bouncing that ration out, 
Uh, I believe he said they knocked back some of the barley out of their ash and added in some grass hay to slow that, slow that track down. And he was extremely happy with it. So uh, these pictures here, that's a flowery hybrid on the left. That's one of my grain corn hybrids, early grain corn hybrids, NS273. All that is is four seconds in a coffee grinder, just to show the processability of the, of the kernel. So yeah, we had that slide before, but that ideal silage versus an ideal grain, we want that big thick stalk, more digestible fiber above the ear, hopefully lower ear height, and opportunity to throw some extra leaves if possible. So this is one of my favorite pictures of all the pictures I've taken, and I've taken a lot of pictures. This is my first year with North Star. Uh, this is over at Lacombe. I got a phone call from the grower. He goes, you gotta come look at my silage pit. Kind of like what you did to me earlier there. I didn't know if he was serious or not. And uh, so I drove all the way to Lacombe, three hours to Lacombe, not sure what I was getting myself into. I was there when we silaged this. Filled the pit of 913, went over into the other bunk, filled it, capped it with 1340 maize. He's got one of them TMR mixers that faces the pit. I came around the corner and I had the biggest smile on my face ever. You can see that definitive line across that pit. That's an indicator of the heating in the pit. 913S, flowery starch, dense style corn, more vitreous starch. They're taken off right around the same moisture. You can see the browning in that silage there was more heating in that pit. That anaerobic process was more laborious. Uh, this is, I'll have new ones for you now, but this was one of my first uh, dairy trials I did. Copy of the pickup slip, uh, text from Bart. This is uh, north, of, uh, north of Barhead, Samco corn under poly, we were growing it there. Uh, and uh, we were getting production increases, it was pretty, pretty proud and as we go along uh, we're getting more good success stories with it. Uh, I know we're not doing any corn grazing but I'm going to show you guys this quick. I do a lot of this. A tremendous amount of canning shit. Literally. Uh, I needed a way to show the digestibility of that plant. Of that starch. Of that fiber. Uh, so I was in the feedlot one day at home, walking around. We'd just gotten some new barley in, looked down and looked like cookies with sprinkles everywhere. Finally, the light bulb went off. I've been involved with corn for almost 15 years. I'd never done a fecal starch extraction or a grain pounds loss in, in corn grazing ever. Uh, feedlot, rule of thumb, TMR, no more than 3% fecal starch when we're in complete control of the ration. Uh, I always looked at corn you know, out in a grazing field and poking with a corn stalk or a stick. Well, there's too much corn in there. That was, that was kind of how we dialed in on it at the time, right? So I've got a certain set of baselines I follow. Grazing field, there's always variabilities. Maybe there's 50 acres of grass on the side they're picking at. Maybe they're getting supplemental feed. Uh, so when I go in on a grazing field to do a fecal starch, I wait that bare minimum for two weeks for that rumen adjustment go out into that field. Uh, I'm looking for this greenish brown hue of the manure. There's about five different color phases. Uh, it gets darker than that, then we know we have too much fiber. Lighter than that, you start seeing the orange, yellows, and reds. That's more grain, right? So that's about that perfect load in between starch and fiber. I go look for the average cow, follow her around the quarter, walking around, literally grab a fresh one. No old random turd out of the field, right? comes back with me, gets put in a jar. The reasoning it goes in a jar is because of the methane buildup. You put it in a plastic bag, it leaks, the pure later gets cranky. <laughs> so that's, that's why I hate jar it, yeah. Uh, so save all your old jars, please. Like the little peanut butter ones work the best. I use glass ones when I have to, but uh, that's not what we wanna see, right? So it costs us a lot of money. So when that grain hits that rumen mat, it's hard, it's dense, it's not completely buoyant. A flowery hits that rumen mat, it's just like that cornstarch in the kitchen. Uh, you have more surface area, right? Rumen microbes don't have to work as hard to convert those carbohydrates into usable energy. That's where we get our efficiency with our hybrids. 
I like this one a lot. These are a couple of my favorite pictures. This translates back to silage as well. We want that standability. We want leaf retention, tight sheath retention, low cob set, digestibility, palatability, starch utilization. This is over, over by Erskine, Alberta. Same grower, planted a day apart. 913S, dual purpose hybrid. I went out there, noticed the husk flare there. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It open up, let the wind swirl through there, get it dried down hard and fast, take it to combine. I don't want this to do that. I want to keep that sheath tight on that ear. I want to keep that cob moist to go through your silage cutter. You start flaring out, you invite insects, ear molds, and probably number one, wildlife damage, blackbirds. They'll come start picking a third third off the ear of your corn, that's a big time yield loss. Raccoons, Raccoons yes. Deer. Deer. Moose. You guys had a moose. Didn't you? No. Nope. No? No, you didn't have a moose? Who had a moose? Someone had a moose down here this year. Oh, Milto had a moose. Yeah, yeah, because uh, it was kind of funny because I walked in there and they're like, don't go in, there's a moose in there. Well, we come from yeah. where, where the moose are, so it didn't bother me too much, but I... Uh, what did I tell him? I said, uh, as long as I can run faster than you, I think I'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, uh, they can do they can do damage in a hurry, right? So, so the, if we can keep that sheath tight on that ear, it's 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 a game changer. This leaf retention that's huge. So, when we look at the components of that corn plant, right around 60% of that field yield comes from that ear. Out of that ear, 40% from your grain, 20% from your cob set. The remaining 40% comes from your stem and leaves, and out of that 40%, it's upwards of 10 to 15% from them leaves, depending on your hybrid. You want to hold on to the leaf. It's a high value fiber as well. They're there for a reason. They might as well end up in the pit or the bag. This here, this was more geared towards grazing, but this was me uh, a couple years ago. I was driving down Highway 21 in between Three Hills and Delburn and I seen a cornfield getting planted. I ripped in there, I had a trial bag with me and I said, plant this and give me a call in the fall. He sent me this picture. Normally we would have planted it all out. I wouldn't have just put it in a few planter boxes, but they dumped it in the end two boxes and sent me the picture of the strips. So it goes to show that standability and that structure of that plant. Uh, back to that fecal a little bit. Uh, and I can give all you guys a copy of this calculator. I think Gary has one. I'll make sure he has one and he can share it as well. Uh, I've always done yield calculators. Have to know what it's costing us. We can use this for silage as well. Uh, any of the yellow cells, you can input your, your factors, your numbers. I've turned around and added a manure component to it as well. And that's how I put economic loss costs on different hybrids. Uh, so you'll notice this is, this is actually a real one done by concert, uh, at home there. Uh, we came in at 99.6% TTSD, total track starch digestibility, the other hybrid 92.3. 92.3 seems like a pretty good number. If I would ever got that in school, I thought I was doing pretty darn good, right? You start compounding those numbers over, over your cow herd, it's astronomical what you can bypass without the right hybrid. So starch loss pounds per day, 0 0.04 on ours, 0 0.8 on the other. Corn equivalent, 0 0.05, 1.02. Total starch loss, this is on the whole herd of 450 head, 18.72 pounds of starch. That other stuff, 360 pounds of starch. What that translates to in that ranch cow, I don't know, but I know it's better in that cow than it is being on the ground. Total grain pounds loss on 450 head. We're doing about a third of a bushel. 457 pounds on the other hybrid. Back then, current or, uh, total bush loss per day, sorry, 0.4, 7.63 bushel. Corn was 7.20 when I did this slide. Our bypass loss per, per day in that corn, if it was grain corn, $2.85, $54.96 on the other hybrid. Uh, total grain bushel bypass on the field, we bypassed 81.57. That other hybrid, 
just over 1500 bushel. That's a set of super bees corked to the gills and then some and you just open the gates and leave that grain sitting there in the field. Uh, total grain value at that time we discharged $587. The other hybrid was just over $11,000 worth of grain. What that translates to to fetal growth, beef gain, I'm not too sure. Uh, probably maybe never be able to tell you, but it just goes to show what it's costing us exiting that animal. Uh, added another cent a day on our end. All of a sudden it was 18 cents a day on that other hybrid. When we look at the loss cost per bag, we were losing 489 in grain. The other hybrid was losing uh, $94.21 in grain value. So those are kind of some of the fun things I do. Always want to think outside of the box, progressively learning, uh, dialing in. Corn's a high input crop and uh, it gives us some pretty phenomenal tons, but I want to be able to maximize it to its true, true potential. These are just our hybrids. We know the lineup, 913. That's been our go-to down here with the dairy, white cob, flex ear, flowery hybrid, very good fiber digestibility, low ear, tall plant. And I'm the youngest and the baldest. <laughs> and one thing we do pride ourselves on is we are 100% Western Canadian farmer shareholder owned. So... The people that are involved in North Star Genetics are just like all of us sitting in the room. They, they have stakes in the game, they have cows, they, they have to put up with markets, fluctuations, weather, they, they get it, right? Which is, which is huge. So, yeah. But anyways, that about has it for me. Thank you guys. You got any questions before Dustin takes over? So I'm Dustin Weinkoff. I'm the region manager for precision planting for Western Canada. So I look after um, all of our dealers in uh, most of Saskatchewan, all of Alberta and BC, and then the business that we encompass in there. And then obviously fortunate enough to get to work alongside guys like Jaden and get to come meet you guys and, and talk about planters and what we can do. So I wanna start it off with, right, the idea is today, right, we wanna talk about how do we protect all of the potential of that seed. Now we're gonna talk about corn today, but this applies to canola, it applies to anything we're doing. We need to think about, you know, how do we protect that potential? So I'll ask you guys the question, when is a corn seed at its highest potential? It's not a trick question. When you put it in the ground, when you put it in the ground, when it goes in the seed. Okay. Yeah, I guess when it goes in the seed. That's right, in an unopened bag. Right? Arguably, we are buying, doesn't matter from who we are buying, the best genetics you guys have ever had. Right? They are being bred for our areas geogra or geographically um, to get the feed values and to get the tonnage out that we need. As soon as we open that bag, all things are on the table. Everything we do from here on in, right, from a mechanical standpoint or Mother Nature, Mother Nature always wins, we don't get to decide that, everything changes. So I, I want to put a dollar perspective into this for you guys, because I think naturally as humans, we all understand money and we feel the pain and gain when it comes out of our genes or when it goes back in our genes, right? So if we take a 16 row planter to 34,000 population, five miles an hour, and if we said a bag of corn seed was $300 a bag, it's, I understand you guys are a little bit cheaper down here. Um, we were using this in Manitoba. 80,000 seeds in a bag. I want you guys to think about every second, it's costing you 86 cents, just in seed, okay? Every second. Yeah, just wait, it hurts a little bit more. So then, right, we need to think about the cost of an hour, right? If we're paying for labor, if we've got to do a service call, a dealer's got to come out, do some work on the tractor, on the planter, whatever it is, right, we're paying a cost for that. You know, if we're paying for a lawyer, an accountant, or all these other things, right, there is a cost to them. Now, if I ignore all of these numbers here and just figure out just in seed alone, at that $300 a bag and 34,000 population, it's costing just under $3,100 an hour in seed alone. An hour. An hour. That hasn't paid for fuel. 
that hasn't paid for depreciation, that hasn't paid for the man, that hasn't paid for anything other than seed. So I start that off with, can we afford to do a poor job mechanically with our planter? We can't, right? And it's going to cost us the exact same amount of money to plant a good crop as it does a poor crop. Sure, there are some maintenance things and other stuff we look at prior in the season. There may be a monetary value associated to it, but when it comes time to go to the field, if we pay attention to all the details and the things we need to do, you guys are trying to protect $3,100 an hour and get everything we can out of it. Fair statement? Start yes. off with, how's that feel? I like to ask that question. <laughs> yeah, I, I always like when somebody gets squirmy in their chair because I know like there's just, I, I felt just. Sat down and about yeah, yeah, yeah. So when, when I did this presentation, when I built this, um, it was for out in Manitoba and I was trying to think of a way to really like, how can I really associate the cost of what we do and put it into a number? I can stand up here and talk all day, but when we put numbers to things, it, it becomes real, right? So when we think about accuracy versus precision, right? The definition of accuracy is how close the data point is to the true value. So if I went with my gun to the target range and shot this, right? I got six or seven shot, six shots on there. I'd say I was fairly accurate. I hit the target every single time, didn't hit the bullseye. Now, when you look at the definition of precision, it's how close those data points are to one another. So if I go there, right, and I think about, you know, a sniper, I've got my gun sighted in really well, my grouping is very, very tight. I'm repeatable. I can repeat that action over and over and over and over again. Now I need to figure out how to get to the bullseye. If we think about this from a planting perspective, think about repeatability from a metering standpoint, from a depth standpoint, I can do that every time. Now I need to figure out how to get my emergence perfect. That's gonna come from management decisions, okay? So when we think about, you know, prepping for the planter and where it all starts, it started last fall. Whether you guys harvested the field that we're gonna now put into corn, whether we silaged it, whether we grazed it, that residue management, maybe it's the tillage practice prior, us banding fertilizer, we just had this conversation, right? We are prepping for the planter pass. And we need to think about, right, how does that set us up? So you guys are banding your fertilizer. How are, how are you guys putting your fertilizer on? With the drill. With the drill? Same thing? What, what, what else do you guys see locally around here, how a bunch of our fertilizer? Some floating and working in. Okay. Reducing every year. More and more guys are just using their drills. Okay. So we need to unlock that seeds 100% potential. So we're gonna go through a little bit of play math here to make you guys understand, you know, all these things, how they affect an ear. So Jaden showed you guys some pictures of some beautiful ears that you guys can grow. Now envision that that's one, that's the size of his forearm over there. That's what we're trying to achieve. So when we think about misplaced seeds in the furrow, a misplaced minor, a misplaced major, you guys are gonna have about a 10th of an acre loss or a two tenths of an acre loss. It's not a lot, but there is a bit of a loss there. When we go to a double and a skip, if we have a double, four tenths of an acre loss. If we get a skip, it's eight tenths of an acre loss. Do we know why a, a skip is not a complete loss from a yield perspective for that plant not being there? Exactly, right? The other one gets to get a little more sunlight, a little bit more water, a little bit more nutrients. Where we really start to pay the price is when we think about emergence. Okay, so if I'm one caller behind, it's a 50% yield reduction. If I'm two callers behind, it's an absolute weed. It will not produce an ear. So before we go any further down to this, when you guys look at your silage corn, from a tonnage weight perspective, what percentage do you guys say of your tonnage weight comes from the ear? It's 40%, isn't it? 60. Okay, 40, 60. You wanna try? 60. 60, okay. 60, that's kind of the number, grand scheme I like to ask. I've heard some guys, I had a guy in Saskatoon tell me 40 last week too, right? 
So if we say 60, now when we look at, okay, 60% of our tonnage weight comes from the ear. So that one that's two callers late, I've lost, if that ear isn't there, I know it's, the ear's gone. I'm gonna have a little bit of matter left in there. When we think about feed value, how much of our feed value comes from the ear in a percentage wise? Would be safe to say 80? Percent of our feed value is coming from the ear? Okay, even say we say 70. Yeah. We've now missed that. Now we've missed a whole bunch of nutrients and we've missed a bunch of tonnage. We don't want those ones coming up later. So when we think about what causes these, right? Maintenance and mechanical setups are gonna cause your misplaced seeds and your skips and doubles. Emergence is 110% management decisions and choices that we make. So spacing errors, when we think about this, and this is where we'll really get into your guys' planters and some of the pre-conversations we had. When we think about spacing, right? That's how the row unit's riding. So if we went across where we ran our drill through and banded, what's that row unit gonna do? Cha, 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 all the way through, it's gonna affect our spacing. It's gonna change the way we you know, release our seed, deliver it. Skips and doubles, so singulation, is caused nothing other than by a meter. A meter is the only thing on that planter that can cause a skip or a double. Never let somebody tell you something different because they're lying to you. We'll, we'll go into that a little bit further. And then emergence we look, right? We need moisture, we need oxygen, we need temperature, good ground condition, that residue managed, all the things that Jaden talked about earlier, we need, that's gonna affect our emergence. So he, Jaden put this up there before. This is the part I want you guys to focus on here is when we go out and do the emergence flag testing and understanding, you know, you guys, are you on 30 inch spacing as well on your planter? You guys are 15 K. So every 34 feet, 10 inches, that's a thousandth of an acre for you guys. 30 inch planter guys, 17 and a half feet is a thousandth of an acre. Have you guys ever went out and emergence or flag tested your corn? We're gonna do that this year. Next time I come back and I say, did we go out and emergence flag test? The answer is gonna be yes and we're gonna have a story to tell. The idea behind emergence flag testing is we wanna do it early in the season and we wanna understand from an emergence standpoint when the first one pokes its head out of the dirt, that is day one. So I want to go out in my 17 and a half feet or 34, 10. I want to put a flag at every one that emerges when that first one comes out. I'm going to come back 12 hours later. I'm going to put a different color flag in and all the next ones that emerge in that time frame. 12 hours later, we do it again until they're all up. Those flags can stay there for the season. We watch them grow and when we get close to maturity, we can go take those ears, we can pull them, we can cut the plants down, we can run them through the chipper, we can weigh them, we can start to paint that picture locally for you guys on your farm, what that number actually means. Now, I'm very lazy. I like to work smarter, not harder. So I have in my truck, I have ropes cut for different spacing. So if I come out to your guys' field and we say, hey, we need to check this, 30 inch spacing, I grab a rope that's 17 and a half feet long, we can just throw it down and I wanna check that right away. So when we go to do that and check it early in the season, if we're planting a 32,000 population in a 17 and a half feet, how many seeds should be there? 32, right? Do we have 100% germination? No. So we wanna to try to find that balance, right? We're gonna be finding 31, 32, 30. That's where we're trying to find all the time to make sure that you know our population's correct and then watch it emerge. So from a grain corn perspective, if we add an extra row, it will add seven bushels an acre. If we add an extra row on the ears, and if we go from a 16 to 18 round, for instance, that will give you 22 bushel an acre from a grain corn perspective. So when we just think about weight and Jaden went through the calculator, we can start to do that math about, hey, what does that mean for you know, a tonnage perspective for us? So we're gonna get into a little bit of the maintenance. Have you guys looked at your planters yet prior to going to the field? Not this year yet. Not this year yet. Good catch, good save. Yeah, we gotta get out of the snow bank first, right? So we're gonna go through this. Some of this to you guys is gonna seem pretty simple. We're gonna breeze over some. We're gonna spend some time on some other. 
So on the bar right, we're checking for cracks, make sure gussets are all welded up. We wanna check for pins out, bushings wore. What I want you guys to know is all of these pictures are real pictures. We didn't you know, go fabricate these and go pound a pin out of your planter, take a picture and then put it back in. We're pretty good at looking for these things, but we wanna go check them. Make sure that tire um, pressure is at the right pressure. We've got the right tires on. Um, it's crucial for the bar leveling. Do any of you guys have markers on the planters? We hire ours done. You hire, you get yours done? Okay. You guys, you got GPS, perfect. So do you guys have weights hanging on the end of your, on the end of your bar? You guys are a three point, correct? Is that what we said? No. Yeah. No. But we don't have weights. Do we? Don't have weights. Weights are for what? For if you no, weight it down. I don't think there is. Weight okay. Did you take the roll markers off? Yeah. Oh, okay. No, actually, they're still on. Okay, they're still on. So you guys, if they're still on, you guys have some weight on there then. So what we need to understand, and we'll get into it a little further, is a lot of the time our planter actually needs weight added to it, to the bar, to make sure that it holds itself to the ground so the row units can do the job that it's supposed to. So as we go into this, you're, you're a six row though, right? Yeah. So you're a little bit smaller. We're not trying to take, you know, the balancing weight as much. Um, check for, you know, hydraulic hose rubbing, electrical tears, leak down um, on air if you guys have air on your planters. Rule of thumb is seven minutes, 10 PSI. That's all you're allowed to lose. If you're losing more than that, we gotta fix, a, fix an airline. Mechanical drives, this I cannot stress enough of the importance of mechanical drives. When you guys have um, a hex shaft that runs through, it goes through a hanger bearing, we've got this joiner and we've got chains. If we have a flat spot in that chain or bearing, what does that do to our meter? Exactly, right? We get that nice and easy and then a unload. Nice and easy and an unload. Nice and easy and an unload. I cannot stress enough how important the drive line is um, on our planters to pay attention to. Anybody, you guys doing liquid fertilizer in furrow with the planters? Most probably will. Most probably will. Okay. If you got it on there, make sure they're clean and we get rid of all the crud and stuff that's in there. I don't know how many times at the start of the year, over the years, guys have phoned and I got an issue with the liquid system. We've got plugged orifices and leaking diaphragms and it's because we had a whole bunch of crud that essentially got left over there in the winter. So the bar is pretty simple. Now, without the bar, the row unit's no good. And without the row unit, the bar's no good. They kind of have to go hand in hand. So when we go look at the row unit, we're going to look at this front to back. The first one is really simple. Make sure your U-bolts are there, that they're tight and the row units are in the right place. Not uncommon for things to get shuffled around and moved. This is where we get into the fun stuff. Parallel arms. Have you guys ever seen this? You're pointing like I've seen that. Do we have that on the planter? Okay, so do you put an aftermarket bushing in? Okay, good. So when this happens, what it causes is we cause a variable depth planter. Okay, so when that planter goes down in the ground and the row unit engages, we have downforce holding it down. If that row unit can ride within the bolt wear of that, we become a variable depth planter. It can get so bad to the point that we can actually have row units get bound up and not be able to go down into proper depth. A couple years ago, a friend of mine, they custom plant, they have spring downforce. He phoned me and said, hey, we've got two row units on the planter that aren't going to depth. We can see them behind us. We can see them driving behind. They won't go all the way down. I think we broke a spring or a cam, but we can't find it. Can you come out and take a look? On my way home, I wheeled in the field. I seen two of these row units partially sitting up. They got to the end of the headland, stopped. He jumped out. I knew what, I'm pretty sure I knew what the problem was. I said, grab the back of the row unit with me. We both grabbed it. We gave it a jar up. The row unit fell down. The holes were so oblong that they had actually bound themselves and got stuck up. Okay. If this happens, do not, you do not have to go buy brand new parallel arms. 
You guys, you can make your own. There's aftermarket ones, SI distributing. There's a bunch of different ones we can get. You ream the hole out, you put a bushing in it, a hardened outer, a softer inner, and a new bolt, and away you go. A John Deere parallel arm is wore out the day it's brand new. Yeah. So the top ones, flat bar steel, you guys know this, you work with steel all the time. They run them through a stamp press. What happens to one side of the hole when we run it through there? It's, all re it's already collapsed. Yeah. So I've seen brand new John Deere parallel arms go on and in 300 acres, they look as bad as the ones we just took off. There's a lot of aftermarket things available. Our dealers can get all of that kind of stuff for you guys. Okay, we want to inspect our shanks. We're looking for, you know, the seed tube guard bracket broke off. Did our disc wear through into the shank? Do we have cracking around those hubs? You guys run row cleaners? Yes. Yes, okay. So on a row cleaner standpoint, we want to make sure bushings and bearings are good. They go up and down as they should. Treader wheels are there, tines are in good condition. Um, and make sure that, you know, the tines are higher than the treader wheels. If we've got them, we found a planter the other day that the treader wheel had more aggressiveness than the tines did. And he said, I, that's the way I bought it. I thought it was doing a good job. Showed him what a new one was supposed to look like and he was quite amazed. Okay, when we get into the furrow creation um, and depth, this is where we're gonna spend a bunch of our time and this is gonna answer the question to why did I not get my seed to depth? We've seen, you know, on certain rows. So do you guys pull apart the planter? How many acres are we? We're not doing too many acres with those two plants. 100? 120. So every couple years we should pull this apart. When's the last time you guys had all the discs off? Never. About four years ago I did. Okay. Never? Well, we got a project for you when we're done here. I know what we're doing. That's why I'm here. Good. So I've got up here, guys, the spec of a brand new, or the, of a brand new disc up here. So from a deer perspective, that's what we have in the room. A brand new disc should will measure 15 inches. At 14 and a half inches, it is worn out and needs to be replaced. Not 14 and a quarter, 14 and a half. Get rid of it. Okay, when I was out in Manitoba, there was one guy out there, he said, yeah, when well, my neighbor takes it off at 14 and a half, I put it on my planter. And I said, what? And he said, well, it's better than what I had. I said, what did you have? And he said, a lot worse than that. I don't want you guys to do that, okay? So now when you guys get discs, again, I'm not picking on deer, but I'm going to pick on deer. Their quality control of discs coming from their supplier has got significantly more poor over the last few years. Um, there are some aftermarket ones, wear parts, nickels, a few other ones that have some significantly better spec and we seem to have better luck with them from a wear side as well. So when you guys get a new disc, what I want you to do is you put a bolt through the hub, put it in a vise. I want you guys to spin it and I want you to check it essentially for some run out. You guys can put a screwdriver there. We're just trying to make sure essentially that that hub is centered in the disc because on some of them they get shifted around. Well, it really changes what our disc does when we go to shim. And we wanna make sure that they're flat. This might've happened from shipping, but we wanna check that. So the hole isn't centered. Yeah. Yeah, they're like they're tolerant. So when they cut this out and then drill the holes, if they're slightly off, now the disc doesn't run to a true. And when we get into our disc shimming here, we can never get it shim properly. Okay. So do we want our discs to look like this? This is looking into the row unit. Do we want to see that gap there? We don't, right? So what happens is when the discs are improperly shimmed and we have this gap here, we kind of create this W in the bottom of the trench. This picture's off our sand track um, down at headquarters, but it creates a W in the bottom of the trench. If we have a W in the bottom of the trench, what does our seed not get to? Doesn't get to the bottom, right? We go back to the emergence thing and the management choices. 
Well, now we've got an air pocket. We don't have good seed to soil contact. We're gonna see delayed emergence. So when you guys go to shim your discs, after 100 acres a year, you don't need to do it. But every couple, two years, it's probably a good idea to check this. It's really easy. Take a business card from the top, a business card from the bottom, and you go till they contact where the discs meet. Take a mark with a paint marker, measure what that is. We're looking for one and a half to two and a quarter inches of contact right here. So you find that on the first one, give the discs a spin, check it again, mark them, measure them, check it again. You wanna check in three spots and kind of find the average. It will not be perfect. I just want you to be somewhere between an inch and a half and two and a quarter inches all the way around on those discs. Don't have any case planters in here. Seed tube guard. This is where I believe your guys' problem comes from. What is the purpose of a seed tube guard? Well, number one, it's... Okay, make sure the seed falls to the bottom. Protect the seed tube, right? That's its name. I don't like the name. It kind of drags the bottom of the furrow a little bit and holds it, holds its creation. Its largest job is, we run a V opening disc. We have a seed tube guard here. When those discs go down on the ground and the ground pushes against, that seed tube guard is what holds open the trench and creates the width of the trench. As that seed tube guard wears down and gets more narrow and more narrow, we can't get our seed all the way to the bottom. We start to get seed riding to the top, some will fall down, some comes back up, and we just get this inconsistent wave. We can never tell what happens. <clears throat> this seed tube guard here um, on a John Deere brand new is 15 16 of an inch, wore out is three quarters of an inch. If it is less than three quarters of an inch, change it. What starts to happen, guys will start to find um, failing hub bearings and cracking hubs. We had a guy last night that said, yeah, I just keep failing these bearing hubs. Told him to check his seed tube guards. And I'm curious later today when I talk to him if that's what he found. So I just take a three quarter inch wrench. If I can slide it over top of it, I know it's got to go to the garbage. This is what it looks like with a new seed tube guard from a furrow. This is a worn out one. That's real life. A planter got rebuilt, they got powder coated, got missed, went to the field, had a bunch of issues, found out it was a seed tube guard. Great opportunity for a photo op to share with you guys of what that looks like. Have you guys ever tied up the closing wheel to see what your trench looks like? Have you ever lifted up your closing tail and tied it up and then looked to see how wide your trench is? Oh no, I, I didn't I, I am betting that is probably where the problem arises. There's one other possible thing it can be, but it's most likely this that you guys are seeing. We've got worn seed tube guards on the planter. That is a dumb name. Right? It doesn't make any sense. Zero. And you, the amount of people, like last night we had a really good group of growers. We had a custom guy in there that had no idea that there was a spec that we needed to be aware of on that. Because of the name. I mean, why would we? It, it, it's a seed tube guard. Yeah. It's to protect the seed tube. Yeah. Okay, so then when we think about worn depth components, guys, the deer planters, right? We've got this mustache here, and then we've got the gauge wheel arms. So as these mustaches wear down and the gauge wheel arms wear, what happens to the depth of our planter? It changes. It can start to go all over the place. This is, a, this is a common, common, common wear component. Now, when we get wear on our gauge wheel arms, can we flip them and use the other side? The answer is yes, okay? So on your guys' gauge wheel, you got a left and a right. If this side is wore down, we haven't used this side, you can take the right one and go put it on the left side and vice versa, and you have a fresh side to use. John Deere doesn't tell you you can do that, but you can, the exact same. What you're going to replace at that time is when you flip those arms, you're likely gonna to have to put a new mustache on. Okay, and that's what dictates as our wheels are moving, right, that hold that pressure there and make our mechanical depth stop. So 
when we think about gauge wheel shimming, have you guys ever shimmed gauge wheels on the planter? Okay. So why we want to shim gauge wheel, or what it, we'll start with this, an improperly shimmed gauge wheel. So we put a GoPro on a planter. You guys can see right here, all of this dirt boiling out the back. Where it comes from is it enters in the front here, comes between the gauge wheel and the disc. It runs the potential of falling down to the bottom of the seed furrow prior to the seed getting there. So we run the potential change in the depth of the seed, but also if it's a dry band, that seed is now laying on dry dirt down in the furrow. If you watch these GoPros in a really clear resolution, the dirt becomes like, it becomes very fluid at speed when we're creating the trench. So it flows like water. So as it flows around, it sneaks in between and comes in there. This is a video of a properly shim gauge wheel. You can't see any dirt boiling up in and underneath here. So the rule to check that is, planter up in the air, grab your gauge wheel, lift it up to the depth stop, let go of it. If it falls, like just falls straight down and goes bang, it's not tight enough. What we wanna do is we wanna be able to lift it up and when we let, let go of it, it wants to come down slowly and we want it to slightly rotate counterclockwise on the way down because that means that gauge wheel is contacting the disc all the way down as it comes down. Does that make sense? Really, really, really overlooked thing that causes emergence issues um, in the field. You guys running Keaton seed firmers? Yeah, so these bushings here on the deers, they can become a common, they are to be greased, not over greased, but they are to be greased. If they wear, there's some aftermarket ones we can get to tighten, but when you guys go to adjust them, if you tighten them up, lift up and it comes down and falls sideways and it doesn't stay, this mechanism is completely worn out. It can be rebuilt in an aftermarket kit, but yeah, something to be aware of as well. Are any of you guys running Keaton seed firmers? Okay, so it serves two purposes. Number one, you can put liquid in the furrow if you want with it and not have to have anything extra. This is the product that founded Precision Planting back in 1993. It is the same one as it was back in 93. We just made a quick attach version versus um, one that you had to strap on. So the idea behind the Keaton seed firmer is we drop, this is our furrow, we drop that seed in there. The Keaton is going to come along run in and we want it to take it and press that seed and push it down into the bottom of the trench so we get good seed to soil contact. Now all our closing system needs to do is just get dirt on top and make sure we don't have an air pocket. This is arguably the cheapest thing you can put on your planter and yield a, yield a gain because you will get better seed to soil contact running this. If you don't have a Keaton on there already and you guys are going in and checking discs, it's a really good time to throw these on. There's a quick attach bracket. It goes over your shank bolts, put all your stuff back together and you just clip this in. You want to take it out, you just clip it out. Where do you get these from? Trevor right here. So Trevor's your guys' precision planting dealer locally. He's in Vauxhall. Um, I think for a bracket and a new tail, like 50 US bucks. Uh, well, 54 Canadian, if they're John Deere. There you go. 54 Canadian dollars. Now, when if the tail ever wears out because they start to look like this, they're like 20 bucks or 25 bucks just to replace the tail. If you have them, what we want to watch is we don't want to get this sharp point here um, because it runs a potential of starting to grab that seed and rolling it up and down in the trench. So if you guys go on like these ag talk forums and all these things, guys are like, well, I had Keaton's, but they drug some seed. It's a lot of times because they were wore out or they were actually in really clay conditions and these were building up and they turn into like a turkey leg and they slowly start riding out and they just start grabbing stuff and moving it all along. You guys aren't in clay ground where you're at. In some places. In some places. If we got into a condition, oh, I didn't bring it in. If we got into a condition that was sticky, we have a low stick version of this as well that would 
I would say essentially mitigate most of those problems. I would start with these. I think this is most of what yeah. you've been doing down here. Okay. So you guys can, and I mean the brackets are the same. You want to try some of each and see what they look like. You're more than welcome to. Okay. Now we're going to get in. Have you guys ever calibrated depth on your planter? So when you check it with the measuring tape, do you check it while we're planting and we go measure or in the shop? No, in the field. In the field. Okay, I'm going to give you guys something, some pre-homework while we're doing this maintenance. We're going to do one more thing. Have you guys ever seen this where we got some rows that emerge really well and we got a couple rows that just never emerge quite the same? Yes, here we go. So when we go to think about depth components and mechanical depth, we've got a depth handle here, there's a bushing in there, there's a mustache with a bushing in there, there's gauge wheel arms, and everything wears. So there's a little bit of mechanical variability here and a little bit there and a little bit here and a little bit there, and it turns into a lot of it when it comes down to the ground. So on your guys' planter, you know that each notch we have on like a deer or a white, right as they go down, that's a quarter of an inch as we go on the ground. So our natural way we do it is we will set all of them at the exact same depth. Say we want to plant at two and a half inches or two and a quarter inches. They're all going to be at the same. We check depth. Yep, we're happy they stay there. We want to go de deeper. They all go deeper. We want to go shallower. They all go shallower. Is that a fair statement? Okay. So what happens is I want you guys, we're going to look at it this way. Get a floor jack, take a piece of flat bar or a flat plate, take some two by two tubing and just tack it on there. Go and set all of your depth handles at two inches, what should be two inches on your planter. Take this, wheel it underneath and jack it up underneath the gauge wheels until the gauge wheels hit the mechanical stop. And what you're going to do is you're gonna see, do my disc touch this plate, yes or no? If they don't touch it, it means we're too shallow. Let the pressure off, take that down a quarter of an inch again. Jack it back up, yep, we're good. Oh, we're touching, the discs are touching before the gauge wheels have hit the depth stop. We've got to go shallower on that row. You will likely find on your six row or your 12 row that they are going to be in different positions to get the exact same mechanical depth. And that will change every single year. The ones running behind the wheel tracks are going to wear harder than the ones maybe out on the wings. So what you do is when you get them all set, take a paint marker, take some t something to scribe and mark on that row unit. Here's our baseline of two inches. So if we know we wanna be two and a half, we know that all of them just have to come down a half an inch. This one might be here, this one might be here. Because when I come out to your guys' place, I have a horrible problem of fidgeting with things and touching stuff and you get it all done. Dustin comes out, I play with it, I leave and I've just messed up all the hard work you did and we have no idea where we just were. Okay. Another way to do it is um, put your gauge wheel all the way to the highest setting and then put the cap under, put your disc um, under until it lifts up and then you sit, put your um, depth stop and then it touches. Yeah, handle down till it touches as well. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit easier. Yeah. So nonetheless, this is something I want you guys to look at while you're in your planter. Between a couple of those things, I think it's going to fix most of your guys' issues. What do you guys have for downforce on the planters? Springs or airbags? Springs? You guys? Okay. It doesn't have this? I believe there's a spring. Okay. So. From a spring perspective, make sure that, you know, the springs, nothing's broke and that down on the side, the cams are in place. We'll talk a little bit about downforce management here in a few minutes. Um, from a meter perspective, all of our dealers have what we call a meter max test stand. You guys can take your meters off the planter, bring them to Trevor, he can come to you. We put the meters on there, we can run them, we can test them. So we can check for vac leaks, we can, essentially tell you, you know what vac to run we can simulate your speed you can give us the exact seed you're using 
and we can run it through there to get them tuned and set for what you guys are doing in the field. Now, <clears throat> what we don't want to see or smell is this kind of stuff. Yeah. So from a storage perspective, at the end of the season, are you guys taking your discs out of the meters? We take them apart and clean them. Okay, we clean them. That's awesome. What do you do with the disc then? Do you put it back in the meter for the winter? Well, I clean them out like now. Yeah. So then we don't put that in there to clean it out. And okay, it you clean it in the spring? Yeah. Clean it when you're done planting. Well, that would be a better time. That would be the right time to do it. It would be, because then we don't get these little critters that want to go in there and make nests and chew on our brushes and yeah. make a bunch of mess. Clean them out at the end of the year when you guys are done. And as well, do not leave your like discs, your meters, our plates, do not leave them in there over winter or over the season. When you guys are done planting for the year, take them out, put them on a dowel, hang them in the shop, get them out of that meter. They're thin, temperature changes and pressure causes them to warp. And if they start to warp, what happens from a metering perspective? We don't meter very well, okay? No, this is this is good. This is why we're doing that. Yeah, and you just we should have had that guy sitting in here to make sure. <laughs> that's the that's the trick. So you know this now, so you can go to him and say, "Have you checked this lately?" And he'll go, "Nope." Well, you need to. That's where this gets good. You could resurrect it, right? No, <laughs> we had nothing but issues with that thing. That's why it's hard to get to the fence. Yeah, we oh, can. Not so seed tubes, guys, what I, the other thing we want you guys to check is on the bottom of your seed tubes, we want to check for things like hangnails. Anything that as that seed comes down through the seed tube, if it can catch something, it's going to change the spacing in the dirt, right? I also want to make sure that you don't have any seed tubes that look like this. I got a phone call a couple weeks ago from a guy that was going through, you know, ready to go through his planter and he phoned doesn't have any of our stuff on, but he was complaining and saying, my planter did such, and they do custom, my planter did such a poor job, was metering properly, but in the ground, it's absolute junk. So, okay, well, we'll come take a look at it. So myself and that dealer, we went up there, we walked in the shop, I grabbed the first seed tube out, and this is what I found. And I said, where's the rest of it? And he said, the rest of what? And I said, the rest of your seed tube. We found multiple ones throughout that planter that looked like that. Sensor was counting perfectly. Sensor was there. After that, we have no idea what happened. Check it. This starts to happen when the seed tube guards get wore down and the discs start to wear on these and torque and pressure breaks them and away we go. So I wanna show you guys what seed release looks like in one of your guys' meters to set the stage for spacing. So do you guys know, are you running a Promax 40 disc in your meters or just a standard deer corn disc? I don't know. So a Promax 40, it is a flat cell. So it's, it's a lot easier to control from a vacuum standpoint and a singulation standpoint. Um, a Promax 40 and a standard deer disc release the same way. This over here video I'm going to show you guys is our ESET, which I have here. But what I want you guys to see is on a standard meter and disc, the seed is released and runs all the way down the side of the seed tube. Okay? We release it down the center of the seed tube. So what happens here, you guys can see as it comes down, we get the ricocheting effect, and that seed can stay longer in that seed tube and start to play effect on our spacing down on the ground. So I just wanted to show you guys that um, from an ESET perspective, we can take your John Deere meter, and this only works with Deere meters. We change some internal components inside. We put a new baffle plate in, we put a floating singulator in, um, new brushes, and you get a new disc. And you can right away see how much thicker this disc is. So it releases the seed better into the seed tube as well. You will run a significantly higher vacuum with this. If we run a significantly higher vacuum and a really aggressive singulator that we're trying to knock every seed off and use vac to bring it, if it gets rough in the field, 
what's what what benefit do we get out of that we're not going to run the risk of unloading a meter from bouncing through the field right we want to run a higher vacuum to hold everything there with getting no skips and doubles now depending on the year of your guys's um meters do you know do you have a double eliminator in here on your deer do you have a little flip Do you have a finger planter? Yeah. Oh, we got a finger. Okay. Do you, is your guys' vacuum or finger? Finger. Oh boy. Well, we don't even have to go down the vac world then. You guys have, so you guys with finger meters, take them to Trevor to get them tested. Finger meters are very, very, very accurate when tuned perfectly. And we can, at a, a certain speed, they are like darn close to 100% singulation. Okay. Well, see, this is good. I didn't. I just assumed we had vac meters, so we won't. We won't worry about talking about that part. How many of you guys have ever planted in that? So dusty. <laughs> yeah. So that, I want to throw this up there. If we ever get planting in conditions that it's really dusty, a standard seed tube sensor will not read. The dust covers the lenses and they can't read. So you'll be going one way and it reads good. From a population, you come the other way and it just goes blank. We wonder what's going on. We have a seed tube, it's called Wave Vision. It's microwave. So it can read through all of that dust. Um, just another option that's out there. So from the closing system, we wanna check our closing tails to make sure um, that they're tight that down here we haven't wore the spring through the eyelet, that the springs are actually all intact. If you guys start to get wear on your rubber wheels, you can flip them and run them on the other side and get the extra side of wear as well, because they naturally wear off one side the way they run. This is not what you want to see from a movement perspective. So there's some bushing kits you can build your own to tighten those up as well. And the idea is, right, we want to make sure that that closing system is aligned over top of that furrow. If we're one way or the other, we run the risk of that wheel going into the furrow and we're not actually closing under the ground. So from a planter maintenance guide, you guys can take that QR code. You can go online, go on to precisionplanting.com. You guys can download the planter maintenance guide. It will go through pretty much everything I just did with you guys. So if you forget, you got something there um, to go off. So we've got the maintenance done, we're gone to the field. So the idea is, right, Michael Bloomberg, a number of years ago, right, pissed a bunch of farmers off in the US and said, I could teach anybody to be a farmer. You dig a hole, you put a seed in it, put dirt on top, add water, and up comes the corn. Made a lot of people mad. I have counterparts that if they could find this guy, they would probably bury him. I've given a lot of thought to that and like, I kind of like what he said, because that is exactly what we do. We just do it with a lot more detail and there's all these other things behind it. So when we think about that, we have what we like to call